Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. This episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback, as a Kindle ebook, and an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com and sign up with audible.com for the first 30 days. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. My guest today is an actress and a producer. Her name is Jenna Edwards, and she is an award winning producer. And her first feature narrative actually was released on Hulu at the same time being released in theaters. And they call it day and date. You might have heard that terminology used before, day and date. It means that the movie is played in theatrical locations as well as online all on the same day. Now she just happened to be at the right place at the right time because Hulu was just starting up and they were able to get their feature narrative onto that platform as well as into theaters and not having so much as the rift or animosity that um, was brewing in the last few years between theater exhibitors, theater owners, and online platforms. The first time I learned about Jenna was on my friend's um, podcast, Jason Buff, over at IndieFilmAcademy.com, and he had a really long uh, interview with Jenna. It was fantastic. So I wanted to do like an add-on basically ask all these type of questions that weren't answered in that particular interview. And one of the things was really fascinating to me was that Jenna had a near-death experience, pretty much, nearly died. And that perspective of her whole life changing um, to still continue with this dream of making movies and you know acting in movies and so on. And you'll hear her story about how she dealt with that. And I think a lot of us may have our own demons or ha- or have our own barriers that we have to deal with. But I think when you get that perspective, when someone's life was almost ended, then how do you, what kind of perspective do you get out of that coming, you know, coming out of that and moving forward to doing what? Making movies. And so her goal is to make movies that matter because obviously she came from an incident um, that was life-changing, as you'll hear. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to Miss Jenna Edwards here on the Film Trooper podcast. Well, I came to LA, let's even back up further. My parents met playing in a rock band. So I was introduced to show business very early on, and they were quite successful in my home state of Minnesota. Shout out to the Minnesotans. (laughs) <laughs> um, what town in Minnesota did you, did you were you born or grew, did you grow up in? I was born in St. Paul, and then I spent the majority of my life in a town called La Center, oh. which had 2,006 people in it while I was there. And so it was a really small town in the middle of a cornfield. The nearest <laughs> mall was 30 miles away. And it was an interesting upbringing when your parents are playing in a rock band and have a big giant blue school bus uh, parked in the front yard and (laughs) people, it was, it was just fascinating, but I'm grateful for that experience though. At the time I really wanted my mom to put on an apron and bake a cake. I just (laughs) really wanted her not to show up in my classroom with ripped jeans and spiked hair and makeup out to here. Um, but now, looking back, I'm, I'm just so grateful because they were constantly playing and constantly practicing and constantly booking. And I got to see how much work goes into a creative career and how much business is actually in show business and kind of the process. And so when I came out here, I came out to Los Angeles to be an actor because I'm going to date myself, but before I moved out here, we didn't have behind the scenes DVDs. And so there basically was like two career choices if you wanted to be in entertainment and that was acting or directing and I didn't want to direct. And I always enjoyed performing and enjoyed that part of it. And so I came out here to act and I was actually really lucky because I moved into an apartment right next to another actor, which... Really, if you're in Los Angeles, it's not luck. It's just the way it is. <laughs> this is a numbers right. game. It'll just right, happen. Right, totally. <laughs> literally throw a rock and hit like 20 actors on a, at any given moment. But I um, met up with him and he had a manager. And so I got an interview with his manager and 
that manager got me my first audition, which was for Unsolved Mysteries, and I booked it, and I got my SAG card, and actors hate me for that because I literally got my SAG card on my first audition. Um, and it was such a fascinating just process because I was so green, mm-hmm. you know, and I showed up on set, and I literally, this this guy was on set, and they were like, oh, the script, and I'm like, there's a script? Because it was all improv, really, because it was, you know, reenactment. And um, anyway, that's a totally different story. But <laughs> through that, I, um, because I got my SAG card, I was able to get auditions. But more importantly, when I moved out here because of my upbringing, I understood that I needed to make connections in the business world. Um, as an actor. And so I started interning at an agency. I interned at a management company. I worked in casting. I asked anybody I could what their positions were while I was on set. Um, And so I really started to understand, first of all, that there's way more positions in film than acting and directing, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) number one. And number two, that, you know, as an actor, it's so important to understand what everyone's role is so that you can be a part of the team instead of a distraction from it. Um, And so I often, when I coach actors or when I consult with them or teach them, I am constantly telling them to understand the crew positions because you're going to want to know when it's appropriate to interrupt the director with a, with an acting question and when it's appropriate to, you know, talk to the gaffer about, um, lighting or when it's appropriate to talk to the camera people about your, your mark or, you know, those types of things. And so, um, I got really lucky in that, in that sense. And then as I was moving forward, I, I had auditioned for Buffy the Vampire Slayer Mm -hmm. a year before it was supposed to end. And, um, I didn't get the part, but then I got a phone call from my agent that said, um, hi, Buffy wants you in the last episode. And I was like, that's, they've got the wrong person. Like I didn't even, I haven't seen them in a year, you know? And they're like, no, no, they, they remember. And, um, I got the script. I was so excited. I remember. (laughs) And, um, I got the script and it was, there were no lines. And so as an actor, you're like, oh, it's devastating. Right. Mm -hmm, Yeah. But I was like, no, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to put Buffy on my resume and I'm going to get to work with Joss Whedon, which is a personal career highlight for me. Mm -hmm. And so I went on the show um, and I had one day of shooting and I remember walking around thinking, oh my God, when Joss sees me, like I had my total insecure actor moment. When Joss sees me, he's going to be like, who the hell are you? Like, I didn't cast you, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But then he didn't do that. And he was delightful. And, um, and I get to say I was in the last episode of Buffy. And not only that, but I was the last scene ever shot on Buffy, oh. which is kind of cool and kind of tragic because when they said cut, yeah. it was the last time that they would say it. And so people were like really emotional. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, what do you do? Um, but then I thought, oh my gosh, my career is going to take off. Like I'm going to get all these auditions and it's going to be amazing. And my dreams were coming true. And at the time I was working at an acting school and um, the episode aired and about a month after it aired, I was having like the weirdest day and I could go all into that if you want me to. But it was just this bizarre, like horrible day and my coworker was like, you know what? You should take your break before me. Like it was his time to take a break. But instead he was like, you go ahead. You're having a bad morning. Like go clear your head. It's going to be great. And so I walk outside and I'm in Santa Monica and it's gorgeous out. But I just feel gross. And so I call a friend of mine and I'm talking to her on the phone. And at this time, cell phones were not as big of a deal as they mm-hmm. are now. And so it was really weird that I had my phone with me. And – um. And I walk out and I went and I bought some oranges and I had a conversation about oranges with the orange vendor, which I also thought was really weird. And right as I was about to leave, there was screaming. 
And it's, you know, Third Street Promenade at Santa Monica, so it's not unusual, but it made me turn my head to look towards the actual Third Street Marketplace. Um, oh, because I was at the farmer's market at the time. So they have this amazing farmer's market on Wednesdays, and I was buying oranges. And so I look over, and I see people and tents and things flying through the air, like literally flying through the air. And I had enough time to think, oh, crap, it's a tidal wave, and then realize that the tidal wave or the ocean was on the other side mm -hmm. and before I saw a car come out from underneath. And so there's this old man driving this car through four blocks of people in Santa Monica, and he came right at me and hit a big giant table and swerved. The table hit me, and then the car killed the man standing next to me. And that day, he killed 10 people, and he injured over 60 of us, and they say he hit me at 60 miles an hour. And then he um, he put his car in park and got out, and my whole life completely changed. I um, suffered severe post-traumatic stress disorder. I couldn't speak. I stuttered when I talked. I forgot basic words. I couldn't read. Um, I didn't sleep for eight months. I was having flashbacks and panic attacks like three times a day that would make me pass out. And I thought I was never going to be able to act again. And I thought, frankly, I thought I was going to have that happen for the rest of my life. Like I thought this was something I should get used to because it's not going to go away. Um, and I remember the day I was diagnosed with it, the, the therapist was like, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I said, no, I don't. I'm not a soldier. Like it didn't re register mm -hmm. that like normal, quote, normal people could get it. Um, and it was – was just insane. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's not really a good way to describe it, but my whole life did change, and it wasn't because of Buffy, and it was because of this event, and it, the things that have occurred ever since then have been pretty incredible, actually. So what happened, like, you're, I think I remember reading, it was like three and a half years, it was, um, when was, yeah. how long from the accident before you were diagnosed for PTSD that uh, the therapist, was it a year and a half or two years later? I No, I was diagnosed right away. Oh, okay. But my, um, my family has a history of addiction, and so I refused medication, which would have just regulated the chemicals, because the way it was described to me... Um, that made the most sense is that we as humans are animals, right? And we have the fight or flight mechanism in us, mm -hmm. but we're society has made it. So we're not going to punch someone and we're not going to run away when something like this happens. And so that means that the chemicals that are produced when you have that fight or flight sit in your body because you're not burning them off any, any, any form. And once they're in your body, they alter the chemistry in your body and specifically in your brain. And so if they sit unregulated for long enough, it's a real problem. And so because I refused the medication, I wasn't sleeping and it nearly killed me. Hmm. And I finally um, decided or was forced, I don't even remember how it happened, but I was finally convinced to take the medication because I wanted to sleep. And there was a moment where um, I wanted to sleep so badly that I ransacked my apartment trying to find the entire bottle of sleeping pills. And mm. I would have taken the whole bottle, not because I wanted to die, but because I really wanted to go to sleep. And at that point, my brain was like, I literally went crazy. Like, I, I'm on a mission to make the word crazy less taboo mm -hmm. because it happens. And if you get help for it, it can go away. But if you don't get help for it, that's when you see the, you know, the homeless people that have been to war. I just can't even imagine. Anyway, yeah, I digress. <laughs> um, so there was a moment where I realized what I was doing in in the ransacking of my apartment. And I called my friend and I was like, I have to go to the hospital. Like, I can't do this by myself. 
And um, I spent 13 days in the psych ward. Hmm. And it's not something I'm proud of, but it's something I talk about because if somebody breaks a leg, you, you expect them to go to the hospital, yeah. right? But if somebody breaks their brain, like that's what I say, it's brain injury. It's right. not a head injury, or I'm sorry, it's a, I call it a mental injury, like where your brain just goes click and you're like, what's going on? Um, like you should expect to go to the hospital then and get the help that you need. And so many people don't. And it's, it's really tragic. But um, I got the help that I needed and it took me three and a half years before I could work again. Hmm. And I'm a workaholic. So that was horrible. Yeah. Horrible torture. <laughs> um, and did... then it took seven years before I didn't have a flashback again. Interesting. So during this whole time, there, was there ever like a moment that, I don't say you said three and a half years, but to get back to work, was there was a there a one moment that kind of clicked where you're like, okay, I'm I'm back, or I'm cut, or was it just yeah. a series over time over years of like I'm slowly getting back, I'm slowly getting back, you know, to to your fiery self now, you know, because obviously <laughs> you know what I mean, like when we talk about it, like you have this wisdom and experience from this, um, but. Yeah. Was there a moment or was there a series of moments that led you to finally like, okay, boots back on, here I go? I think it's interesting. It, it, that's a really good question. There, I feel like to get back to my fiery self, it was definitely a series of moments, but I do remember this one moment. No one's ever asked me that. <laughs> There's this one moment I, um, I had just gotten a job at, so I'd slowly been working like here and there, but I hadn't had the capability of going to a full-time job without having, like I was having flashbacks every day. Mm. And so as they were like dissipating and I was having them once a month, once every six months, you know, that kind of thing, um, I was feeling really good. And so I went back to full-time work when I got this job at Picturehead, which is a post-production house in Los Angeles. And I was a runner. And I'm telling you, I was the happiest person on the planet the first day that I went through the whole, like it was a night shift. Hmm. And I went through the whole like 14 hour shift without a single panic attack or a single flashback. And I felt amazing. And I realized like, I'm back. I'm able to really, you know, make money and contribute to society and, you know, just do a really great job at this little PA job that I was doing. Um, and my now husband, we were, we weren't married at the time was going to school for post sound editing. And I was able to support us while he was in school. And that was like the best feeling in hmm. the entire world. Um, and then when I, I don't really know when I realized I was fully back, but that's the moment when I realized I could be back, gotcha. I guess, is a good way to say it. The reason I was asking or kind of d d digging deeper in that is that yeah. there's a lot, you know, a lot of creative types. Obviously, filmmakers or, and there's a, if we can focus on those filmmakers that are like that want to be writers and directors, they want to be you know the creative leads or whatever project they have inside them that they're trying to get out. Um, yeah. There is that reality of real world of. Uh, you know, how many years they might stop themselves like, I've been doing this for, you know, 15, 20 years yeah. and nothing's happened. Like, I, I mean, I have some things, but I'm still not creatively satisfied. There's there's all these blocks that uh, a lot of us have or people might have in the listening. Yeah. So what's fascinating to me about your story and your experience is that we're talking about, we're, you're like, I will take you to an extreme where I was involved mm -hmm. in this horrific accident. That and lost the, my mind. <laughs> yeah. It, well, th there's some, something ramifications come out of it. Right. It's like a, a war zone type of a, an effect. And if somebody could come back from something so extreme like that, it helps. I, uh, the idea is that those listening might be like, wow, okay, yeah. if she can do it, what were the tools? Was the grit uh, seeking help or whatever it is? Because when we're at our best physically mentally then we feel like we can you can search through right. you can have the grit to like search through and go nobody believes in this movie more than i do or this project and right. you kind of need that and and 
because we can get easily get lost and discouraged and and be our worst our own worst enemies and just feel like we're never quite getting there or never feel like yeah. I'm I'm as my you know chutzpah is there where it used to be. So yeah. um, I was just curious if there was one moment or was a series of moments or the every day you still deal with it, but it's like okay. But once you once you realize that great feeling, that great yeah belief that I can support my husband as we do this, I'm contributing. I I have the capability of doing this. So that's sort of yeah. that that turning point that any great story would have. So now we move forward. <laughs> we move forward. I have so yeah. Many tools too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have so many tools that I now um, share with filmmakers to help them d- overcome what you're talking about. Yeah. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. I'm ready for you to take us okay. to the next journey. So we've, next we've, journey. we've gone through this, d- the dark <laughs> part. It's, it's like, well, how do you come from the rebirth and everything that you're doing now? Because there's a lot of things I want to get into, like the, the film business itself, but uh, sure. I'd love to hear, you know, how this, well, I mean, this I feel like this is the, the foundation of a successful film career is in my opinion, really understanding what you as a human want to get out of your career. And I think oftentimes filmmakers and writers and actors are just so passionate about being a writer, a director, a filmmaker, an actor, that they're not realizing that you're putting energy into creating this beautiful career that you want to have. If you're putting energy into um, things that aren't leading you towards what you actually want to be doing in that career, then you're wasting your time. And what I mean by that is if you at your heart, and I talk about this all the time, so please forgive me those who have heard (laughs) this story before. Um, If at your heart you want to make romantic comedies, please, dear God, do not make a horror film. Like that's not, it's not going to A, fulfill your soul and B, move you further along your path to film success because you're going to be networking with the wrong people. You're going to be making, you know, connections with the wrong film festivals, DPs, editors, potentially. I mean, obviously, you know, if you're a good DP, you can work on a good project or you can be a good DP. Anyway, my... The reason I say that and the reason I'm so passionate about people doing the work that really inspires them is because that is the only way I have found to overcome those blocks that you're talking about. It's the only way that I was able to overcome PTSD is because I was able to focus on doing a project that was so close to my heart and and that, that project is April Showers, and I mm-hmm. talk about it all the time. It was written and directed by a phenomenal writer and director, Andrew Robinson. And he survived Columbine, and, which, in, which is extraordinary in and of itself. But the movie was about the incident and the five days afterwards and how the, the people affected had to pick up and move on with their lives, which was something really true to my heart because Hmm. while I was going through PTSD, everybody was focused on the people who passed away and the driver and all of these things that, that weren't about the survivors and all of the, the horrific things that were continuing to happen in our lives because of this one person's acts. Um, and the film was the first project I had seen that really focused on that. And to me, that story was important enough to commit two years to, yeah. you know, and I mean, there was a point where we were literally in Nebraska and our funding had fallen through mm-hmm. and we were like, how are we going to get our crew home? You know, and so those types of situations that happen on independent film and film in general, but when you're on indie film, you don't have money to throw at the problems. So you're like completely stressed out. If it wasn't a movie I cared deeply about, I probably would have given up. Yeah. And so there's, because of the PTSD, I know that I have to, A, focus on things that I really care about. Like, when you have an experience where you almost die, like, there's something that shifts in you where you're like, life is too short. Like, it's not worth you know, messing around with your time on something that doesn't matter to you. 
granted, I do have to say, people say that all the time, right? Like, oh, I realize life is too short. I feel like the realization of life is too short is an ongoing process. <laughs> so that's my disclaimer. Like, I've done projects after April showers that I'm like, why did I waste my time? You know, but but they weren't successful. And they weren't things that I'm like talking about all the time because they weren't, they didn't match with what my true passion is. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to do one thing every day. You know, I talk to, I oftentimes talk to actors more about this than filmmakers because filmmakers tend to be doers on a different level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. But actors and writers are often times dependent on somebody else to give them validation and permission to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I just, my big advice is to set up a, a space in your home that is just business. And, you know, it's hard now with technology because we often put our computers on that space and then we watch Netflix. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. <laughs> like, make it just business. And that could be you know, today I'm going to, you get up every morning and for 10 minutes you write your to-do list. And it is only focused on your career as an, as an actor, a writer, a director, a producer, whatever it is. Just spend 10 minutes on it every day and make it a habit and do one thing. Make a list of all the things that you need to do and then pick one that you're going to do every day. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. I have That's this, yeah. the biggest piece of advice I could give. I have this... Um... Uh, accountability Academy, uh, a membership that I have with Film Trooper. And oh, what cool. it is, I work with uh, those who are in the membership that um, taking a little bit of that, which is like, here's your daily journal. And the journals, you keep it real, real simple. It's yeah. like, what are three things that today that if you could accomplish would make it a great day? And it could be something, but you have to put in there too. Like, a, a wonderful time with your 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 kids, or a wonderful time with uh, with your wife. Like it's, it, not, it doesn't always have to be work related. Like yeah. it could be like I know I'm going to have a great lunch with so and so. Like that would make it a great day. And then it all kind of kind of sometimes pairs down to that one thing that they work on their project, which is like you yeah. know to, if I can get three five, three to five pages written today for my script, that would be a great day. You know, so yeah. it puts it in perspective. But then you have this tracking log. So when you go back and you look at, here's what you did this month. And here's this, it's, so it's like, look right. look where you started and where you ended. And it's sometimes we've, it's, it's those little things. It's like, wow, I didn't realize I did this much, you know? So it reminds me of a lot right. of what you work with or your 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 clients and so on and, and people that come yeah. to you. I was curious because I know that in Jason Buffs and the Indie Film Academy podcast, you were talking about <laughs> the, the the transition to producer. Yeah. And you're the kicking the, and screaming process. Yeah. So like people are saying, you're great at this. You should do this. You do this. I'm fascinated because with PTSD, sometimes there's a, a, there's an aspect of anxiety. I'm, I'm assuming that comes from. Oh, that. yeah. So because the filmmaking is so volatile in terms of, like you said, we're working in Nebraska. All of a sudden we have no funding to get the crew out and cast and crew. How does someone with, uh, 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 you know, dealing with PTSD, with the, the uh, advent of anxiety, deal with something you don't have control of? Because I know yeah. a lot of people that have anxiety and when they don't have control of their, their environment, sometimes it can kick in. So mm -hmm. how do you, like, first of all, anybody listening to this be like, okay, yeah, those are just the realities of producing. They're always constantly right. changing and, and I go crazy myself. But... Then but you, when you're actually crazy, add, yeah. no, no, no. but you add the level of the of, of your what's happened to you. Like I said, yeah. th this is this is the part like a screenwriter going like I'm going to raise the stakes. Not only does yes, this producer have true. problems <laughs> having no money to get the crew out of Nebraska, we're going to add that she has something mentally like uh, challenging that's going to make it even worse. So how do you right. deal with something Cut like that? To 22 films being written about a crazy producer with yeah. PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to talk to you guys about research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a really, really good question, actually. Uh, I think blissful ignorance played in a little bit because <laughs> I hadn't done a feature. So there was a lot of moments of, oh, that'll just work out. 
But the only reason I was able to say, oh, that'll just work out is because I'd done all of this work to overcome the PTSD. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were, I remember there was this one moment where, okay, you guys, when you don't sleep for eight months, it is like indescribable how your brain just doesn't function. It just like literally won't function. And so there was a point where... um, I, I'm a, I'm still to this day extremely protective of my sleep, but I hadn't been that protective of it until this incident happened. And it was we were on a location scout in Nebraska. It was um, Andrew, the director, and uh, the other producer, and I. And we were um, we had been going now. I think it was like five days, and we were maybe getting three to four hours of sleep a night. And we were just like booked from the time we woke up to the time we went to bed. And It was like the fifth day and we're sitting at this restaurant and we hadn't eaten all day and we were so tired. And I remember um, this thing that would happen to me and it happened for the first time with Andrew and he was sitting across from me and my brain just shut off. I remember staring at him and I remember seeing his mouth move, (laughs) but I couldn't process any words that were coming into my ears from him and he's just like, it got to the point where he had to literally shake me and be like, are you okay? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I probably should have warned you. Like sometimes my brain shuts off. And so the way that I would um, work with that was to, to understand that that was just how I functioned now and to be really open with people that I was working with because it is a really bad thing not to be able to tell people about your quirks because if they happen in the middle of something like crucial, then everything falls apart. And so (laughs) I was like, oh yeah, sometimes when I get tired, like my brain just shuts off. And it was something that I would just constantly tell people so that they would be prepared. I would also tell them that what a flashback would, if a flashback happened, this is what's going on. Um, Because I can only imagine how terrifying a flashback must have been for the other people. Like, I know it was terrifying for me because I was reliving, like, a really horrific experience. But when you're having a flashback, it's like you're literally in a different place. You can hear the people around you, but you can't get to them and you can't say anything to them. And so I remember when I would have them, people would be around me like, oh, my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? In my head, I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. It's just something that happens. But I couldn't say it to them because I wasn't there. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So my way of, and I do this now anyway, When I, even though I don't have flashbacks, my way of handling it was to set the expectation and be like, this is something that happens. Here's what's going on. Here's what you need to do or you need to know. Um, don't worry kind of thing. And so... Now, the way that I kind of translate that skill set, if you will, is to set the expectation on a film no matter what. Here's what I expect from you. Here's what you should expect from me. Here's how I work. Here's how I don't work. Like, you will not be able to get a hold of me on a Sunday um, unless it's an emergency. You know, like just setting the expectation so that your team members on a film really understand how it's going to go. So that there are no surprises, so that and so that in the beginning, and do it really early on, in the beginning, you'll be able to see whether or not that person is someone you actually want to work with. You know, oftentimes we just get in these situations where we've agreed to work with someone, and then like six months in, you're on set and you just are so fed up with that person that you want to like cry every day. <laughs> <laughs> so my my whole application of all of the PTS training has definitely manifested into communication, understanding who you are and how you operate so that you can explain that to other people, Um, and really being true and honest about what your strengths and weaknesses are and where you're at in your life. I don't know if that makes sense, but they're, they're, they're definitely influenced by all of the healing from PTSD on Mm. my, my end. Yeah. Fascinating. I was curious because you were talking about 
setting the expectations of the workplace, you know, when you get into a film project. And as in the, again, your your interview with Indie Film Academy was talking about, you know, everyone was telling you you'd be great at producing and, and it was sort of pushed into that. Now, what do you see as sort of your strengths um, in terms of, because producing is sort of a wide field. So there's like those producers oh. that are like, uh, they're the money people. They just, right. they, the business, they go, I get the money. Then, then, then there's the other producers, like, I know the nuts and bolts of the filmmaking process. I can create a budget so I can predict where we're going to have problems or foresee, you know, things that could be potentially costly or ways to cut costs. And then there's a, and then that kind of sometimes bleeds over to the creative producer, which is like, you know, a record producer that has an idea of like how to help the director and the, and the creative team to hold them together to, mm -hmm. to push towards this, this one vision. Um, what have you discovered to be your, your strengths within the producing realms? It's interesting because it's evolved. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's what's fascinating to me, and I didn't answer this part of your question before, and I apologize for that, um, is that with the PTSD, you're right. Like, it is a con total control thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you become very OCD. And so I think that my strength while I was still recovering on my first film was the fact that I was OCD about certain things, and I was very organized and... And that's why I got kind of drug into producing, which, by the way, disclaimer, <laughs> I really love right now. So it's, it just at the time was in denial. Uh, <laughs> but so the the nuts and bolts was something I was trained on, I guess, in my first production, just trained through experience. Um, and it was a good fit for me because I was so OCD at the time. Um and then it's evolved into, I think my biggest strength now is the ability to see the project from start to finish in my head and make all the different connections and be able to explain them. Oftentimes, the explanation part is the part that's lacking in the producer. Hmm. Like they're very good at whatever the job is, but explaining what the aspects of the production are to the other producers is is something I really enjoy and something I think is lacking in a lot of producers nowadays. And here's the thing too. I think producers don't understand what producers do. <laughs> yeah. Like it's fascinating to me. Um, you know, and and no one trains on it. So it's like, of course they don't understand. But in my experience, the the lead producer is the one who's able to say, okay, we've got this film. How do we get it funded? How do we get it produced and shot and edited and all of those nuts and bolts things? And then how do we get it out in the world? And the out in the world part seems to be just a shoot from the hip kind of mm -hmm. idea or model. And it needs to be thought of way in the development phase you know like if you're working on a script right now and you're a writer and you came to me and you were like this is how I think it could be marketed I'm going to listen to you so much faster than I'm going to listen to your your creative pitch because to me as the producer the content and the creative part I know can be really nurtured but the thing that makes me excited is what what's special about the project that I can really sink my teeth into so that I can get you funding, so that I can get you the crew that you need and the cast that you need, so that I can get you the distribution and the marketing that is necessary to make the money back. So the job of the producer is, is more like we're creating a company that we're going to sell. What are all the elements that are going to go into that company so that it's going to be the most sellable company around yeah basically. yeah because we can change gears a little bit not too but we're still following the line here yeah because you're the you had the one particular project that got in hulu at the like the beginning of hulu's incarnation oh, yeah. first narrative for hulu yeah so Kinda what cool. <laughs> yeah it's very cool so obviously you had that accomplishment in that relationship to make that happen what 
uh, what was that experience like and how do you think it's changed now like how would some a producer get their particular film project onto hulu is it just working strictly with an, the the right aggregator and you know just kind of like show yeah. like well this is how we got on at that particular time but then i know that for a fact like now things have changed a little bit yeah, totally. and, it, and I'm sure it's going to change again. So it's, I, I think it's a very fluid thing, but I was yeah. just curious to get a little bit more, we can dig deeper in your insight so that sure. that could share to other producers out there listening. Sure. Um, so in order to talk about Hulu, we have to talk about April showers and iTunes first. Sure. Um, so April showers that, that was my first full feature that um, was kind of a big deal. And once we had finished it, we made, how do I say it? We were the first feature to do, or I'm sorry, the second feature to ever do what's a day and date release, mm -hmm. uh, which means it's in the theaters and it's on the internet at the same time. You guys have to remember that this was back in 2009, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem like a long time ago, but it's a really <laughs> long time ago when you come when it comes to technology and distribution and all of that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, it was Andrew's brainchild because he was so he loves technology and he loves new things like that. And I'm very old school where I'm like. Can we just call it like Warner Brothers? I just <laughs> I don't want to do it, you know, at that time specifically. And I think that that had a lot to do with the OCD and the controlling. Hmm. Like I didn't want to try new things because I didn't feel safe. Hmm. But we did because I felt safe with him. So that's why it's important to work with people that you know and trust and love. Um, but anyway, so we had partnered up with Indie Flicks. Do you guys know mm -hmm. about Indie Flicks? Yeah. Sheila is like one of the greatest people on the planet and um, you know we were working with them and they got us on iTunes and we decided to make deals with the theaters directly so we were literally calling theaters and um, we weren't doing we weren't doing the pay to play we were actually doing splits with them like we were a big studio or something it was pretty oh, cool. interesting. Um, and so we we had worked with um, Cinedime, they're a, a theatrical distribution company that, like, if you pay them, they'll put your movie on the drives that get projected in the big theaters. Um, so we were working with them about on the actual physical distribution of the the prints, and then we were working with the theaters on the showing in their theater, and then we were working with Sheila over it, and she was working with iTunes. Um, so that we could release it at the same time. And as we were doing it, the theaters were literally like, they called us the horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> they were like, this is going to kill theaters. Why are you doing this? And so there was a lot of um, resistance to that model. And again, it goes back to we were so determined to pay our investors back that we were willing to work through all of those roadblocks. So you've got to figure out on your project what the main like driving force for you as a filmmaker is going to be. Like what is the thing that you're going to hold on to like a teddy bear as you're walking in the dark and there are scary things jumping out at you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's your blankie? Um, so as we were doing that, like we released it. It was number one on iTunes. It was a really big success in the indie world. And then, and then actually... <laughs> There was a um, fire up near Andrew's property, and he was like, Jenna. He literally calls me, Jenna. It looks like the surface of the moon. We need to shoot something up here. And I'm like, okay. So we wrote a script specifically for this location because it looked cool. Mm -hmm. I kid you not. And then he was like, I really want to do something with distribution. Like, what's a new distribution model? Let's test some things out because we had already done the iTunes thing and it, it was really interesting to us on the back end. And so we called Sheila and um, we were all able to make a deal with, with Hulu. Uh, Hulu did not fund it. We just were able to release it as the, like we did it kind of like a live quote theatrical release. Like you're going to watch it. And we were able to make it with them all the that they were going to do and all the promotion we were doing. We were going to be able to say that it was the first 
narrative feature release or made for it or for hulu and it was great like we worked we all worked really well together um but the funny thing is that it was again in 2000 that one was released in 2010 i think i don't think we would be able to do that with hulu right now i mean they're so big that's literally like going up to warner brothers and being like hey i want to make a movie for you and they're like okay like we don't have eight million people wanting to make a movie for us so my advice to filmmakers is to find new things, you know, find new things that you think are interesting and see if you can't work with those things. Like Hulu is now, I'm going to say this and, and please don't send me hate mail. <laughs> I, it's really important for us as filmmakers to look at things without our egos attached and to be really honest with ourselves. And I found that a lot of filmmakers are now using digital distribution with bigger companies like Hulu and Netflix as an excuse for not actually getting their films out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you experiencing that too? It's like the new, well, Warner Brothers won't pick it up. So I guess it's just not good enough. Or why did I waste my time? Or you know, we use these things as a way to beat ourselves up so that we don't have to be brave and make the next thing happen. Yeah. No, no, no. I, let's, let's, let's go into that a little bit more because I think that's the digging into um, with digital. Like I said, there was, you know, what's the difference between like a distributor and an aggregator in terms mm -hmm. of when I, I'll get filmmakers saying, yeah, we got distribution and it's on, you know, it's on iTunes and it's on, uh, you know, uh, Google Play or something like that. And I, and I would ask, like, so what did going with the distributor that you worked with different than why didn't you just pay like an aggregator to mm -hmm. place, put it on placement there yourselves? And um, uh, there is that little bit like it's weird there's still that conversation like i'll see like you know online a lot filmmakers saying yeah. just got distribution got distribution and it's like this holy grail like it ends there like there, it's all exactly done. because then we we don't have to be brave we we can say well a distribution company obviously loved it and picked it up air quotes picked it up <laughs> which means they should be promoting it which means that we don't have to put ourselves out there anymore and face the rejection, the potential rejection of the audience. And it's just not, hmm, how do I say it? That's why I always say, think about distribution way in the beginning, because if you are strategic about it, you can have an amazing release on your own on iTunes and pay back all the money to your investors and then be able to make another movie. But you have to be really smart about it way in the beginning versus um, this whole idea of, of spinning the press, you know, as an independent filmmaker, I got distribution. It's like, did you? Like, I, I, and I, I say that with all the love in my heart, like I really want to be like, but did you? Did yeah. you get distribution? Are they putting in prints and advertising money? Are they actually going to... <laughs> my cat just like totally came through the living room and created a ruckus um and yes i just said ruckus because i'm 80 <laughs> but like we, it's really important for us to be honest about what is happening in our careers because the goal i feel like is to make another movie and if you're not able to say okay or take responsibility is probably a better way of putting it and say, listen, this is my, my film, this is how I'm gonna distribute it, this is how people are going to get to know me, this is how um, my investors are gonna get paid back. If you don't do that, you're probably not gonna be able to make another movie. Yeah, let me ask you, so we're talking about that's the goal to keep making movies one after another. If we follow the money, what can we do when we expose that trail to say why isn't it that like any other business, like I made a product, I sold, you know, the product made X amount of dollars in profit, um, that should enable me to um, make the next product mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, the next product in my line of products. Why is it that you see or um, 
why one film doesn't pay for another film and why that business model does not seem to to work like you know like it's it's like you make a film you might get the investors paid back but then you're back to square one on the second right. film which is raising money again but the only reason it's able to make a raise more money and maybe a little bit more uh, um maybe easier second round because you're able to show i was able to be successful the first time getting my investors paid back and we got distribution which mm -hmm. is sometimes i feel that some the, the filmmakers are like we i have to say we got distribution so it looks like we did what everything we could do to tell my investors and they knew that it's a risk they might not make their money back but at least we got as far as we could you know right. so the question is why why doesn't that work business model wise um and why does why do we still go down this path and how do we change it in terms I think it of it does yeah. work i think there's a couple of different business models in the film industry um you know the studios are big business like in order to go into the studio system it's a very different path from going in the indie indie system um what what i found is interesting is if i look at independent film as small business and each film is a different business it may be the same steps in the business. Like let's say I'm opening a hair salon versus a pet shop. It's still a small business. It's still the same paperwork to get your company in order. You still have to raise money. You still have to, you know, get in customers. Like all of that, that process is the same. But the business itself is a different genre is how I look at it. That's why I'm saying if you want to work in a specific genre, start there. Because if you're going to open a series of pet shops, it's going to be a lot easier to raise a bulk of money than if you're going to open a pet shop and, a, um, like I said, a hair salon and a car dealership and like all of those things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we established that in the beginning, right? Then it's all about, so we're opening up a pet shop and our specialty is rescue animals so we're able to go out and approach we're, we're able to know our consumers are are a different breed of consumer than somebody who would buy a breeded dog for example mm -hmm. right so we know our specific audience and they're different then we're also able to say you know what that specific audience loves nonprofits. So let's go out and find some nonprofits that we could partner up with and create an event and we're going to fundraise or we're going to have a community awareness event type thing. That's creating community, right? Then you're thinking, okay, we need to find investors. Well, investors want to be in a community as well. So if you look at your investors as people you're going to be working with long term, mm -hmm. I think you'll have, and, and you're looking at your film career as a business and it's in a specific genre and you're going to be known as that specific filmmaker, you're going to have an easier time, you know, if your first film is successful for your investor and your distributor and your, your team and your actors, you're going to create this amazing community that you'll be able to go back to because it was a successful venture. Does that, I don't know if I'm making sense. My, my point in all of this is when it comes to investors, I have found that filmmakers get too scared and then they become stiff when they're talking to investors. Look, investors are humans, especially investors that would even consider investing in indie film they're doing it for a very specific reason. It may be they need a tax write-off. Well, they need a tax write-off every year. So talk to them about future projects while you're developing the relationship. Don't just talk to them about one project. Um, it may be that they are just really passionate about romantic comedies. So talk to them about the fact that you want to be the romantic comedy director. Um, they may be passionate about... Um, we call them cocktail party investors. They may be passionate about being an executive producer in titles so that they can look really cool in front of their friends. Great. 
how many films will they be willing to invest in if you can make them look really good in front of their friends? Like you have to start thinking about investors, A, as human, and B, as as if you are the investor. What is it about you? What is it about your project that is going to appeal to that specific person? You know, you can't just think of all investment in indie film as the same pitch. It's just not the same pitch. Yeah. So in your, <coughs> oh, you're okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. So you mentioned before, it's like one of the things that you've been trying to help independent filmmakers understand. It's like, make sure you pay yourself. So like when you develop, oh, yes, God. when you develop your budget, <laughs> you know, make sure there's an aspect in there that when you're raising the investment funds that you, there's enough money there to pay yourself to do what you need to do. And you mentioned that it's not necessarily a lot of money per se, just enough that you could do what you need to do. Right. So that if we follow the money that way is that whenever a film project is made per se is um, everybody is working towards their fee. So yes. actors, cinematographers, below line crew, everybody, post-production producers, so the budget, whatever the budget is, so that's paying everybody's salary to, for that for that project, for that right. fee. So the question comes in is, at what point does the film ever get to a place where you don't need the investors? Like, I mean, like, hmm. like you know what I mean? Like, okay, I made this film. It was really highly successful. We made enough money that's now it sits in this, like the, a profit, you know, uh, like account. And hmm. now we don't have to go to um, investors. What That's what's fascinating to me about the film industry is that everybody keeps going back to f raising funds for the next project, next project. And it doesn't matter how big or small you are because Ron Howard had to do that for Rush. Right. He's peddling around. Like, there's Ron Howard. When things <laughs> change and he and Brian Grazer had to change their ways and they had to hustle to find other investors, you think to yourself, or I think that's what's fascinating to me is like you rarely, rarely hear like um, how Ron Howard or Steven Spielberg saying, no, I paid for everything myself. Like from right. all the wealth that I've accumulated, every movie I make from this point on is for my own, my own, my own, my own account. The only person I could think of that did that was George Lucas with Star Wars. Yeah. After Star Wars made so much money, he turned around, invested it back into himself, bet it on himself to Empire Strikes and everything else after that. But you don't see that like on the indie film spectrum. Um, which is why the the film industry is fascinating to me because of that. Yeah. And, and even Steve Jobs was somebody who coming in, looking at Pixar's business model, saying, you guys are a production company. And a production company, you're dependent on whether or not Toy Story 1 is going to be success. And then you're going to be dependent on the second film success. He goes, that's no way to operate. So what I'm going to do is we're going to take Pixar public. And the concept there is like, we turn Pixar into Pixar Studios. Public offering means public cash flow now you have a huge amount of investors and jobs was telling you know ed catmull and john lasseter is like you guys there will come a day when you're not you're gonna have a product that doesn't work and you don't want to have right. that one product completely bankrupt your brand or like you were talking about if, if a filmmaker is going to do a genre of romantic comedy they have to have some sort of business system in place so that all of a sudden it doesn't literally just collapse because one romantic comedy didn't work Yet, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. So I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that because, like, how does an independent um, work in the same structure as like these studios, like Pixar? But it's interesting because um, you'll see, you know, movie stars. They'll have production companies come and go. Like you see, like, like what happened to that production company? They were yeah. making a bunch of these films, and one day they're bankrupt. Like bankruptcy is like, like a, a commonplace. Um, Relativity Media went through it, you know. So I just yeah. curious, like, in your what other business models are you seeing that can help combat this sort of, I don't know, this commonplace practice that's been going on with independent film for all this all this time? And you've been able to be successful to make one film after another film, but you're, but again, you're finding yourself like, okay, I got to raise some money, hope it right. build this relationship. Hopefully, that investor invest again. At what point can you, yeah? Anyway, well, I was just I think curious. It's interesting what you're saying because what I'm hearing is that you want to never be able to raise, you don't want to have to raise money again, right? And so for me, the thing that's important to remember is like Universal is owned by General Electric. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, the idea of film 
film is a risky investment. It just is across the board. So I think the better way to look at it is to shift into this idea of how do I create a team or a, a community or a family of investors instead of being like, I'm going to pay for it all myself. That's why Ron Howard doesn't because he knows it's risky and he wouldn't be Ron <laughs> Howard if he paid for all of his movies because he likes his lifestyle and he likes his money and he earned it, you know? And so I think as filmmakers, we have to start being comfortable with selling ourselves and our projects. And I know that it feels so icky. And that's why I'm saying it's crucial for you to find something you're so passionate about because you're going to have to sell it at every stage. You're going to have to sell it to investors. You're going to have to sell it to distribution. You're going to have to sell it to cast, to crew, to other producers, to a director, to a, like anybody that comes onto the project you have now sold into your film. And if you don't have true passion behind it, you're not going to get the team that you need to make it successful. Right. So that if we have that, then the idea is funding is just part of the process. And as long as you can show people that you have a good track record, you'll be able to fund easier. It's like politicians having to campaign mm -hmm. like, you know, most of these politicians out there, we know and we've seen them and they have these track records and they're on public record, but they're still out there selling. They're still out there convincing you to vote for them. So it's not, and I'm not saying filmmakers need to be politicians. I'm saying we just need to start as a community to become very comfortable with the idea that we're offering an opportunity to an investor. But if we're not clear on what the opportunity is, the investor is not going to buy it. So there's that part of it. And there's this other part that, I really want all of us, like even myself sometimes, to work on, and that is valuing what we put out in the world. You know, we as filmmakers literally have the opportunity to change people's lives, no matter what the genre is. Like I often, and I talked about this, I think on, um, yeah. on Indie Film Academy, but it's the whole idea of, back, we're gonna circle around to Buffy, I mean, Buffy was seven seconds of screen time for me as an actor. And I have had so many experiences of people coming up to me and telling me how powerful that moment was for them that it blows my mind. I had one woman come up and say it empowered her to leave her abusive boyfriend. Hmm. Like, just let that sit for a second. It's seven seconds, guys. And she left her abusive boyfriend because of it. So it's just, it's so important that we really honor what we're doing as creatives. And I know it's hard because we probably grew up, like I grew up in a town where football was way more important than the arts, <laughs> you know? And, and I know I'm not alone because oftentimes my friends and I have conversations about that. And I mean, look at Glee. It's like a similar thing, right? You're getting picked on it because you're nerdy choir kid or band geek or, you know, Whatever it is, like whatever your upbringing was, let that go because the reality is art has the ability to change the world. And if we as filmmakers don't start banding together to really honor that and pay ourselves and create careers out of our art, then we're not doing anybody any good. You know, so when you're doing a budget, it's crucial that you pay yourself so that you don't have to work at a day job. Because as an investor, I wouldn't invest in you if you did that. Because I wouldn't be confident that you would finish your project. You know, and I certainly wouldn't be confident that if even if you did, you finished it to the best of your ability because you're distracted, you know, having to pay the bills. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm, this is my soapbox and I'm going to get off of it right now. But I just <laughs> really implore us all to start honoring what we do more. Yeah, nice. Well, we just hit the hour mark, which is perfect because I think it's a perfect way to to wrap it all up. But yeah. um, but you have a lot of other stuff that you um that you're doing and that you're offering. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit more about that as we kind of close up, you know, sure. I hope it was. I hope the conversation was as you know 
I was trying to dig deeper in things that most people like. I don't say don't talk about or it's like I didn't want to do the same rehash of like this is how you get this is why you want yeah. to make the next film and how you get the crew and all this I was like what are I the, hope I went deep enough for you yeah well I hope I I think so so okay. I, I think we 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 touched on pond things that um I hope to give a better perspective of where it comes from yeah you know, like we're talking about someone who had a near-death experience and had to deal with the, the survivor aspect of it so word you know everything that you do drives from a moment that changed yeah. and now it's like you're saying like this is why it's important to me that filmmakers do something that they're passionate that they're that matters matters to them yeah. and um so anyway uh, do, <laughs> is there is there anything i i should have asked you that i didn't ask you or that you think that uh filmmakers like if you know be great if they just take away this one thing uh, from this conversation I mean, no, you did a great job. I hope the that the people listening got something out of it. I'd love to hear from them, you yeah. know. Um, it'd be cool if we could do like a Twitter shout out. What did you learn? What was the best thing that you took away? You know, what what perspective shift did you have? I think that's the key. It's all about perspective, you know. When you're when you're out there trying to raise money or get cast or or make your project, like you have to be able to look at what you're offering from the person you're offering to mm -hmm. their perspective, not your perspective. And so I would love to hear any perspective shifts. It's like a total addiction of mine. Um, this was great. I love that you went deeper and I hope that we went deep enough because it's truly, it's just so important to me that we changed the industry. You know, I had a conversation, or I, I shouldn't say conversation. I met this filmmaker a couple of weeks ago. I think I talked about it on Indie Film Academy, too. Um, but she was a producer, and she started complaining about the fact that she didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you realize you're the one who raises the funds, and you're the one in charge of the budget, and you're the one making this project. Set it up to pay yourself. You know, guys, we are in charge of our own careers in indie film and you don't need permission from someone and you there's very few middlemen at this point <laughs> it's just all about being strategic and doing the thing that you love to do and setting yourself up for success and um the the way that that they can keep in touch with me is i have a, a facebook community which is indie movie mastery community i would love to hear from anybody in there and then um on twitter at jenna edwards and instagram and facebook jenna edwards media nice so if, i'm if, really if you, stoked can they find the facebook uh group and all the other social media if they go to indie movie mastery.com is that a url yep okay yep and then um or jenna edwards media.com is probably a better place indie movie mastery is just one product that i'm working on <laughs> got it got it and i'll make sure to have all the the, the links and the notes yeah. and everything about you in obviously in the show notes so if somebody wants to go there they can find it awesome. well oh, hey thank you so much for having me this was really really fun <laughs> yeah i hope so i wasn't like too much of a therapy you know a therapy session but yeah <laughs> i really believe that if people shared more of their struggles the world would be a different place mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, because it, 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 I think that's what you said. You want to hear. So if you want to hear, uh, reach out to, you know, to Jenna on Twitter or the Facebook and say, like, I just heard the podcast interview and I have a different yeah. perspective on this. You know, I thought I was struggling or but man, this gives me shift like, yeah, there's some things I can change in my perspective and move forward. I just I can't wait to see what people create. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jenna. Thank you Thank so you. much for, yeah, taking in the hour to hang out with me and um, on this uh, lovely day. And uh, um, you're you're obviously down uh, L.A. and I'm here in Portland. And so, yeah, there's a it's nice and warm today, too. <laughs> oh, it's so hot here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And that concludes my interview with actress and producer Jenna Edwards. And you can find more about what she's doing over at IndieMovieMastery.com or head on over to jennaedwardsmedia.com. And if you like this episode, think about leaving a ratings and review over in iTunes. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes and leave a ratings review. It, this just helps get the word out about this particular podcast and what we're trying to do. And again, don't go away empty-handed. If you are stuck trying to make your film right now, your feature film right now, 
just go over to freegearguide.com and get an equipment list of everything that I use to make a feature film for $500 without a crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.